So we currently have in mind uh, ascending English auctions, and a key observation about how those work is that the winner uh, generally winds up paying less than their valuation. They get it at a bargain, they get it at a price which is less than the maximum price they would have been willing to pay. And in fact, that price actually is determined by other bidders' valuations. It's determined by the competition. In our example, uh, we had a bidder who was willing to pay $250, um, but because you know once the price reached $175, everyone else had dropped out. That was the first price that exceeded all the other bidders' valuations. Uh, in fact, the winning bidder only had to pay $175, not $250. So what I want to do now is tell you a bit about a sealed bid auction, which is in some sense equivalent to the English auction, which leads to the same outcome. And by a sealed bid auction, I mean an auction that happens in one shot rather than iteratively over rounds. So we're just thinking about each of the bidders kind of, you know, in effect, writing down a single bid, a single number in an envelope that gets passed to an auctioneer who then decides who wins uh, and what the sale price is. And the format we're going to wind up in is a, is a very famous one and one that's been important also in technology. Uh, it's called a second price auction or alternatively a Vickery auction. Uh, after its inventor, William Vickery, who wrote about it back in 1961 and won uh, the Nobel Prize in Economics in 1996, uh, in effect for founding the field of auction theory. Very simple to describe how it works. So step one is just you collect bids from all the bidders. So each of the end bidders, they submit a real number, a uh, bid B sub I. And I want to emphasize bidders are autonomous. They can bid whatever they want. And indeed, we're assuming they're going to a bid in a way that maximizes their utility, the utility we defined uh, on the previous slide. In particular, a bidder does not need to bid their valuation. Nobody knows their valuation, only they do. So they can just make up any number they want. So they could bid more than their valuation, that would be overbidding. They can bid less than their valuation, that would be underbidding. Or they could set their bid equal to their maximum willingness to pay. That would be a truthful bid. So step number two is the auctioneer collects all of these bids, all of these envelopes from all of the end bidders, and it decides who's the winner. Uh, and the choice of the winner is kind of the obvious one. It's whoever uh, bid the highest. This makes sense both sort of just on an intuitive level, but also thinking back to the ascending auctions. You know, right, the winner of an ascending auction is the one who stays in the longest. So in effect, the highest bidder. If we think of the bid as being how long a uh, participant stays in the auction. In the third and final step, we have to decide on the uh, selling price. So what is it that this winning bidder is going to have to pay for the item? And if I just, you know, if I hadn't primed you with this discussion of the ascending auction, and I just jumped into sealed bid auctions, you know, probably the, the most natural suggestion of, you know, what the winner should pay is, they should pay what they said they would pay. They should pay the bid, the number that they wrote down uh, in the envelope. Uh, and that's a very reasonable auction format known as a first price auction, which is also common in practice. But remember at the moment, we're trying to simulate in a sealed bid fashion what happens in that ascending English auction. And remember that if you know we think of a bid as being sort of how long you would be willing to stay in the English auction, it is just not true in, a, in an ascending auction that the winner is going to pay their bid. They're only going to have to pay just enough to outcompete everybody else. So it's determined not by their bid, but by the highest bid by somebody else, which given that they're the highest bidder, that's going to be the second highest bid overall. So with that inspiration in mind, we will now simply define the operation of a Vickery auction or a second price auction. It will be defined as charging to the winner as a price, the highest bid by some other bidder. That is the second highest bid overall. So that's why these auctions are called second price auctions. It refers to the fact that the selling price is the second highest bid. Now, you know, I think it's natural enough to think about, you know, what would be sort of a slick sealed bid version of an ascending auction. I think that's a reasonably natural question. Um, but a big reason for the focus on second price auctions, a big reason for why they're important, uh, is the following key property, which says they are strategically very simple for the bidders. It's actually trivial. If you're a bidder in a second price auction, it is trivial to figure out how you should bid. Specifically, bid truthfully. That's going to be a dominant strategy, a strategy which always maximizes your utility no matter what the other bidders do.
This is not the first time we've encountered the concept from game theory of a dominant strategy, a strategy which is always the optimal strategy for a player to play, no matter what all of the other players are doing. Uh, the other time we saw dominant strategies is when we were talking about the prisoner's dilemma back in module number two. And there we observed that, at least in the single shot version of the prisoner's dilemma game, uh, defection is a dominant strategy. It doesn't matter if the other player is cooperating or defecting, either way, your payoff will be higher if you defect yourself. So here it's exactly the same mathematical property. It's a different game. Uh, back then we had two players. Here, we, here all of the bidders are players. We have some number N players. Uh, back then we only had two actions, defect or cooperate. Here we have all kinds of actions, all the different possible bids uh, that you could submit. But the property is exactly the same. It says there's this one uh, sort of no-brainer action that you should take as a player in this game, as a participant in the victory auction, and that no-brainer strategy is to set your bid equal to your maximum willingness to pay, to bid truthfully. That will always be in your own best interest, in the sense that it will maximize the utility we saw on the previous slide. Remember, that was uh, value minus price if you win, and then zero if you lose. So a truthful bid will always maximize your utility, no matter what anyone else is doing. Okay, so you do not care uh, what the other bidder's valuations are. You do not care if the other bidders are being truthful or not. They can be arbitrarily crazy. You actually don't even care how many bidders there are in the auction, how much competition there is. You can care less. This property guarantees that it's always in your best interest uh, to bid truthfully, to set your bid equal to your maximum willingness to pay. So that is the magical and famous property of second price or victory auctions. They are truthful auctions in this sense. Truthful bidding uh, is a dominant strategy. The result is extreme strategic simplicity for the bidder. So as a bidder, really all you have to do is figure out your valuation. You just have to sit down, be honest with yourself about what really is the maximum price you'd be willing to pay. And once you've figured out your valuation, you, there's no hard problems left to solve. You should just bid that valuation. So strategic simplicity for the bidders. Absolutely trivial to participate in. Now, as we said when we were discussing The Prisoner's Dilemma, you know, games that you encounter in the wild, they usually don't have dominant strategies. Usually the best thing for a player to do is going to depend on what the other players are doing. And so back then we gave the example of, you know, if you're playing chess against somebody, uh, you know, probably the strategy you want to use is going to depend on the strategy that you're using. It's not like there's some always optimal way of, of playing chess independent of your player's strategy. So that was kind of remarkable in The Prisoner's Dilemma that you had these uh, dominant strategies. It's also remarkable here in the victory auction. Uh, you might say, well, you know, The Prisoner's Dilemma, there we were just modeling stuff we see out there in real life. That really was a game in the wild. Uh, whereas here, you know, we kind of made up the rules of this game ourselves of the victory auction. So given that, you might say, well, you know, should I really be that surprised, you know, that we got this strong property of having dominant strategies, given that we constructed the game from scratch? So that's a good question. Um, so let's actually think about, you know, how special is this um, truthfulness property? So what if we implemented the auction in a different way? Would we also have this truthfulness property? For example, right, so we're trying to encourage the bidders to be nice and to bid truthfully. So maybe what if we tried to be nice? What if we said, you know what, you're not even going to have to pay. Okay, we're just going to give the item to the highest bidder. Uh, nobody has to pay anything, just, you know, bid your true value. So, would that be a truthful auction? Well, if you think about it, um, no, actually. Like, if I'm bidding in an auction where, you know, there's no selling price, you just give it to the highest bidder and then charge nothing, uh, I'm going to overbid. <laughs> I'm going to write down the largest number that I can possibly think of. I'm going to write down, you know, a Google or whatever as my bid. This is really just devolving into a game of who can name the highest number. So it's certainly not truthful, right? You want to bid something which is bigger than everybody else because there's no price to penalize you for a high bid. That's what you want to do. Okay, so that's an epic fail. You definitely have to charge something if you want to have this truthfulness property, which is kind of funny, actually, right? Because how about you normally think of sort of the revenue, you, you know, you think of auctions as generating revenue, and they do, you know, and that is why people run them for the most part. Um, but really, when it comes down to it, you know, you need that price to be non-zero. You need revenue just to encourage truthful bidding, just to get this strategic simplicity property. Okay, so that's one sort of straw man uh, argument. Let's look at another very reasonable auction you might want to use, which is a first price auction. So remember, this is the same as a second price auction, uh, except the third step is different. So again, you collect a bid from everybody. The winner is the same as before. The winner is the highest bidder. But in a first price auction, 
the winner is going to actually pay the number that they wrote down in the envelope. So the bid is really sort of a, a commitment to pay. You charge the winner their bid. So is this a truthful auction? Well, definitely not, right? So with zero price, you were encouraged to overbid. And with a first price auction, there's an incentive to underbid. Right? Actually, it would be silly to bid your actual maximum willingness to pay in a first price auction because that's you know, rendered you indifferent to whether you win or lose the auction. You're going to have utility zero either way. You have zero if you lose. If you win and you bid your value, you have to pay your value. Um, so that just sort of cancels out all of the value you would have gotten uh, from the item. So you definitely don't want to bid your value in a first price auction. You want to bid less than your value. How much less? Hard to say. Kind of depends on how much competition you think there is, how many of the bidders there are, what their valuations are, and what their bidding, bidding strategies are. So first price auctions, you know, while practically relevant, they're highly non-trivial from a strategic perspective. Very different uh, than a second price auction. So all of this discussion is just to, you know, to, to hopefully convince you that this truthfulness property of second price auctions is pretty special. Um, and actually, you know, we will prove this key property, but we're not going to prove the following fact. But the following fact is true, that the Vickery auction is actually the unique one that has this truthfulness property for which truthful bidding is a dominant strategy. So if you want an auction which always awards the item to the highest bidder uh, and that's normalized so that bidders uh, pay zero, in fact, the Vickery auction is literally the only sealed bid auction format that accomplishes that. So it's a very, very special property uh, of the Vickery auction and very cool. So important, in fact, that this will be one of the, the few statements that we really give a, a mathematical proof of in the short course. Um, but don't worry, the mathematical proof is extremely short and extremely easy. That doesn't mean it's not a super important result. It is. It just also happens that it's a very short argument that justifies it, uh, which I want to take you through on the next slide.